Hello, and welcome to the Cynthia Mazzaferro Show. I am so excited to be here with you today. We air every Tuesday evening from 8 to 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time in the United States, and it's seen worldwide. So thank you for joining us. Today, I have a really special guest. It's Courtney Donaldson. Hello, Courtney. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Great. Let me tell you a little bit about Courtney. She holds a master's degree with Ithaca College in New York. She is an author of Clay Jar, Cracked, When We're Broken But Not Shattered, and hosts a devotional blog called As a Clay Jar. Courtney developed the curriculum for an encourager class based on her book, and she is a public speaker and marriage mentor. She counts it a privilege to talk with women and couples about how to navigate difficult experiences well. For more information about Courtney and her book, you can also find it on her website, which is www.courtneydonaldson.com. So welcome, Courtney, and I'm really excited um, to talk about your book and your story and, and purpose that you want to bring to the world. Well, I really appreciate it. I'm excited to be here. Great. So can you ask me, um, tell me why you actually wrote this book? Well, I did not intend to write this book, <laughs> but the book found me, the story found me as it goes. And um, it is my first book. And I just, it, I went through a traumatic experience. And during the middle of that experience, I felt compelled to share my story um, in this way, as well as with public speaking and other um, avenues, um, just because you know what, we all have a difficult story. We all go through something difficult. And um, I felt like I wanted to share how I got through it with others. Great. So a little bit about Clay Jar, Cracked, When We Were Broken But Not Shattered, provides the authentic and raw account of one woman's walk through one of the most traumatic relational stories ever told. And Courtney Donaldson writes this powerful testimony about her own personal marriage crisis and how God revealed himself and became the lead role in securing an ending that defies cultural expectations. And I just wanna say, Courtney, that this is a really beautiful story that you share and that all of us have difficulties at different time in our life, starting mm -hmm. as early as in utero. Exactly might have difficulties with our relationships with our parents, our grandparents, our siblings, mm -hmm. and all the way up into our own married life if we're married, and as well as our own children. And so working relationships, relationships are very much a part of every aspect of our life. So do you want to share a little bit more of the details as to what happened in your marital life? Absolutely. After 13 years of marriage, mm -hmm. I discovered that my husband was addicted to pornography and he actually was addicted before we were married. And so he was leading this secret and double life that I knew nothing about, which eventually led down the road of him getting involved in multiple extramarital affairs due to the addiction. And so in our 13th year of marriage, he came to me and basically revealed this double life. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I knew nothing about it. So it was quite shocking and a blow to everything that I had believed in, everything that I thought we had. Um, we event, you know, over the course of nine days, he revealed each little aspect of this um, life that he led behind the scenes that, again, no one really knew about, um, not just me. And so this story, the book that I wrote, um, is, a, is a compilation of the devotions that I wrote during that emotional ride <laughs> through our healing process, as well as the biographical details of the story itself. Wow. So why do you think he actually decided to tell you that day and come, come forth with that information? You weren't asking for it. No, I, I didn't have a clue. And um, it's an interesting story that he went out for a nighttime run. He is an athlete. And when he got home, he said that he needed to talk um, with me. And so that night started kind of this process mm -hmm. for us. Um, the reason that he decided to reveal everything um, is because we both have a personal relationship with God. And on his run, he was asking God, what's my purpose? How can I 
make a difference in this world. And he felt like God was answering with, I can't use you right now because of your life, because of the double life that you're leading, the secrets that you're hiding. And so that is what compelled him when he got home to start sharing. Wow. I can't even imagine what you must have thought when you first heard this. It was like, oh my gosh, I can't breathe. I mean, it's like... Yeah. Yes, it was certainly a it was certainly a sucker punch to the gut, if you will. My whole life was ripped out from under me, um, and I think the reason it took him nine days to tell me everything is number one, he had to admit to himself mm -hmm. what he had done because he had been lying to himself as well as everyone else, but also because I think he was trying to control the information flow so that I could grasp what was happening and handle. I, and hopefully reconcile the man I had married with what he was telling me. So very interesting. So I have a couple questions. I always like to link what happens in our present life to possibly what has happened in our past, because in my book, Powerful Beyond Measure, I really believe that we live uh, from our past and that we're trying to learn and grow from those emotional wounds that we take on. Mm -hmm. So, if you don't mind answering this question, answering this question is, why do you think your husband, and of course you're only kind of guessing here and maybe right. what he shared, but why do you think he took on this life of uh, pornography and infidelity? What was his family like when he grew up? Well, you know, I think that's a multi-layer answer. Um, I think there, first of all, I think it's a very, it's a much more common problem then people realize because the internet is now in the palm of our hands. And right. so access is very easy. Um, and this is something that he got into while we were in college because he was in a, a lab, a computer lab and saw someone else looking at something. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's a simple kind of trigger that, that occurs. But from childhood, most, most addictions stem from the fact that people are either trying to please others or there's a pain, obviously, a hurt from childhood that you're covering up or that you're, you're thinking you're not good enough um, or you're putting on this um, facade in order to match other people's expectations. There's a whole host of reasons <laughs> and, then, and, again, multiple layers. <laughs> I, and that's exactly true. Once you reveal one layer, another one pops up, and it's not just one. Exactly. Component. That, that's so exactly true, Courtney. And so I'm, I'm assuming there is some component of him not feeling loved by his parents to some degree, and probably even not feeling loved by you. And this is all his own internal processing. Mm -hmm. It's not a qualifier that you weren't a loving wife. It was more that no matter what you had given him, would probably always still not be enough. And he was always searching to find other people to mm -hmm. gratify him and to um, fill this void. Mm -hmm. And so this probably resonates with a lot of people that, you know, if we're always looking from the outside in, trying to find our love and feel loved, that you will never feel fill your tank inside mm -hmm. your love tank because it always just kind of like seeps right through you. You know, you just pee it out. You, you do a, <laughs> a BM and you just, it kind of just goes right through. It's like running water. And, um, and that's why there's that addiction because you can never get satisfied of feeling loved. Mm -hmm. um, and so how about you? How, if you can share a little bit of how you felt your younger years as a child impacted you and what you were looking in relationships for? Well, I think we all have some type of hurt um, that we can probably put a label on. And mine would have been probably abandonment. Mm -hmm. And not related to my family, but I actually felt abandoned by a very close friend when I was young. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of triggered that feeling. Every time I got close to a friend, I would get scared mm -hmm. and push them away. Um, so that I wouldn't get hurt. So I had a, a line of friends in my wake and people that I had hurt trying to protect my own heart rather than um, opening up and just being myself. So um, what happened was then when I was married, uh, I thought all that was over. And so I put my husband on a pedestal that I probably should not have put him on and believed that he was this perfect person, which then just um, unfortunately, re, um, 
what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> Ignited his, you know, concerns about trying to please people. And right. so um, I had to learn the lesson myself and I had to grow in my character and develop and realize that no one's perfect. We all make our mistakes and that's why we are all broken, but we don't again have to shatter that there is help out there. Um, for us, it was our faith. That's beautiful. That and some of you might know that I also had a similar situation. Um, and that was my parents um, got divorced when I was seven years and old. Mm. And so for me, it was abandonment too. I was mm. the second oldest daughter and my father walked out on five beautiful daughters and a mother and just left us. And we never saw him pretty yeah. much forever. Okay. And so, um, so for me, I was always looking for male confirmation, male mm -hmm. um, affirmation as to that I was this great person because I wasn't getting it from my father growing up. Right. Even though I reached um, great success with my business as a physical therapist and an ergonomist working in industry with many, many men, it was that same thing. There was a quench, a thirst within myself that never seemed to be quenched. Mm -hmm. And even my husband one day walked down and said, taking my breath away, that he loved me but could no longer live with me. And I'm like, how do you love someone and not live with them? It just made no sense to me. Right. So it kind of brings up this thing, which I learned was that we all know the law of attraction and how, you know, maybe internally there was an energy, almost an expectation that mm -hmm. men, family, friends could walk out of your life, even though they loved you. And kind of what you just said too, you had this great friendship that really hurt you and devastated you. And this particular individual walked out of your life. Mm -hmm. So all relationships, not just friendships, even more intimate relationships, there was always probably that fear Yes, is, are they going to walk out of you? Can you trust that this relationship will last? Right. And so we actually have very similar um, relationship drama, if you will. The pain, <laughs> and I think a lot of people do. I think yes. we, we all want to feel loved. And whatever the reason is, we don't always feel loved enough. We don't feel lovable because we're not happy with who we are. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of three-pronged, loving, lovable, or willing to love. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really um, an important component because if you're looking for someone else, your partner, your children, your grandchildren, your siblings, to make you feel valued and loved, mm -hmm. you will never, ever be in a place that you are happy within yourself. Mm -hmm. Do you agree, Courtney? I do agree. Um, when it comes to the marriage relationship, I do believe that that was designed to help um, the problem of aloneness. Mm -hmm. And so I think my goal in my marriage is to continually ask, does my husband now feel a little less alone because we're married? And so that's kind of my new goal. Um, but I absolutely agree. I think, um, I think it's difficult. Relationships are always going to be difficult because we're all flawed in some way. We all make mistakes and that's part of being human. Uh, and that's why in my book, as I was trying to process the mistakes that my husband made, <laughs> the big ones, um, I was always looking up to, um, to my higher power, which is God for me in my life. And that was probably for me, the only reason why we're still married um, is the power I got from, for me, within myself through God. So <laughs> Great. And what would you say that power within is? Because that's part of my subtitle to my book, you know, claiming yeah. your power within. And so what would you say your power within that you actually claim? For me, it's the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a follower of Jesus, Christ follower. And so for me, that power came from prayer and from reading the Bible and from trusting in a God who is ultimately good and loves me more than I can fathom. And so when my world fell apart, it was very easy for me to look up and lean on that power because for sure I had none during those um, weeks and months and years of rehabilitation. <laughs> exactly. And I also have a very strong faith with my God and you know, and it's not just in relationships. We have crisis. I had a medical crisis in my family just this past few weeks, right. five weeks, actually. Yeah. And, you know, when you have faith, when you have a strong faith and you have hope, you have a trust, you have a peace within you, mm -hmm. even though you're still hurting, it doesn't necessarily take away all the hurt. Right. 
there's learning opportunities with a hurt mm -hmm. and that we need to experience that we need to grow from but you don't have to walk it alone and that when you have this faith relationship with your god your creator the mm -hmm. word that you use um mm -hmm. that you realize you're not alone in that you are powerful beyond measure. You're not cracked, as you said. <laughs> no, you're not shattered. You're still this beautiful, loving being. Right. And that just because someone else does something wrong, or even you do something wrong. Right. Um, <laughs> that we're not perfect. You know, we're imperfect within our perfection. Um, yeah. And I think there's, you find a lot of freedom if you realize that. Because yeah. then um, the, the shame of almost every story kind of falls away. <laughs> and it's ironic because here, your situation, your husband actually had additional marital uh, um, relationships. For me, it was funny because when he said that, and I knew intuitively he was never out, couldn't have had a, a marital relationship with someone <laughs> else. It actually hurt me more mm. that he was willing to leave and walk away with, from a beautiful woman that had raised two beautiful sons and had a great family and all the parts that go with it that we believe God gave us mm -hmm. counted them as blessings and it was to me it was like worse there wasn't another woman that he decided he wanted to love more he'd rather be without anyone yeah. and and it really didn't doesn't matter if it's someone else or no one else the mm -hmm. pain still hurt to think that they're mm -hmm. looking outside or they want to leave mm -hmm. and I just want to bring back, because I, I heard you say something, and I, want, I wanted to have you think about this for a second. Mm -hmm. And you said that you're trying to um, question, I, I can't really quite remember exactly how you said it, but okay. I, I'm wondering how my husband feels about his aloneness. Mm -hmm. And can you just state it the way you said it before? Or can you just clarify it? Because I want to ask you about that. Yeah, I think, um, I think it was something probably to the effect of, you know, my, our goal in our marriage is each day to ensure that our spouse is a little less alone. Um, that I think the ultimate purpose of marriage, if I go back to the Old Testament in Genesis, is that God created Eve even before sin entered the world because it was not good for the man to be alone. Mm -hmm. And so um, a successful marriage, I think, is if spouses are feeling a little less alone, which um, is a feeling that we all are, all have. <laughs> have to go through, have to um, deal with, and so. And so that brings me up to, to pose this question, because when I work with clients, I would say to them, mm -hmm. not that you're my client, but to say to yourself, is our questioning of our aloneness mm -hmm. actually um, kind of the precipice, um, the starting point of we are questioning that because we don't feel at home within ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I say that, really interesting because I have found that when you become one in spirit within yourself and for me it's I am a stardust of God I belong to God I am part of God I am God and so that when you can be um kind of um in an understanding that you are this beautiful creature of God mm -hmm. and that there is no aloneness mm -hmm. and that you're you don't have to be searching for does my husband feel alone or does he satisfy do am i satisfying him mm -hmm. when you can be present at least is what i have found mm -hmm. when you can be present and true with yourself and mm -hmm. who you are this beautiful being not perfect by any means no one mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. but that then you are radiating out this energy of complete love Mm -hmm. and acceptance and compassion and empathy and there is no gradation of does he feel us or not because you are only that mm -hmm. yeah from i from my perspective i guess i don't consider this life my permanent home and so i think that's why my beliefs are i'm not going to have that complete loss of aloneness until i am with my God. And so until then, um, God created marriage as a way to, to navigate this journey on this earth <laughs> together um, until we can be with him. Yeah. And I, I think relationships, whether you're in a heterosexual relationship, homogenous, even 
not having an intimate relationship. And that's fine too. There's no right and wrong. I think it's really important for us to realize that relationships can be very supportive in many aspects. Right. And that um, often though, I will say, people are sometimes afraid for intimacy or closeness because mm -hmm. they're afraid to be hurt. Kind of like you just said, you know, and Absolutely. What, um, so we, we view it differently. And so those might be individuals that say, I'll work 70 hours a week so I can avoid and say, this is my reason I don't have a relationship with another partner. Right. I don't have time for one. Well, that's <laughs> self-imposed. You're having that time constraint. So, right. you know, I agree with you, Courtney. I think that humans are beings that are meant to feel to mm -hmm. support and love each other mm -hmm. and that, that they're not supposed to be getting the love from others to fill us up. It's about mutual respect and compassion and love. And that you're right. God has created man and, and woman to mm -hmm. join together in union. Um, so that's really amazing. So can you share a little bit about the devotional part, the religious part or spiritual part that really you use during this difficult time in your life? Absolutely. Um, as I was, I had never been a writer before. Um, I, I always had that, that seed of wanting to be a writer ever since I was very young, but I don't think I had the content until this story unfolded. <laughs> and so I was, I was a frustrated, um, soon to be writer. And so this kind of allowed me to bring the content to fruition. So when my story unfolded, I began journaling in order to help work out the feelings and the emotions and everything that were running through my body. And so um, I wrote some devotions, I, I read some devotions. And um, so that's what I've included in my storyline. And I've inserted them at important places during the biography or story of, of my process through learning about my husband's um, addiction and all the way through to um, our eventual deciding to stay together and that the redemption. Um, and so the devotions are not meant to, they were, they were just my, my musings, if you will, um, kind of applying a scripture to what was happening in my life at that time and seeking some peace and some hope um, and looking ahead rather than continuing to sit in the middle of the, of the tragedy, if you will. Well, you know, everyone's listening has to think of you as being such a forgiving woman. I'm not sure everyone could forgive like you are. And that it, I think it hopefully offers people to realize that we aren't perfect. Mm -hmm. We ourselves do things incorrectly. Mm -hmm. uh, comment, <laughs> not comment, not interact. We shouldn't, you know, we should interact. Um, we can all judge. And it's through... Um, empathy and compassion to realize that your husband really did love you, but that for some reason he wasn't seeing the love and was actually reaching out desperately looking for more. And, um, and he actually got it on that run. He got it from God to mm -hmm. say that you have so much right in front of you. You need to come true and be mm -hmm. honest. And that was a really a, an, a remarkable stance for him to be mm -hmm. courageous enough to be transparent yeah. and really shed his fears, limitations, his guilt. Yeah. Um, he, he did not believe the story would end like it did when he decided to start telling me about this life that he wanted to end um, so that he could live the life that he was meant to live. <laughs> You know, and I think that brings up things when people are in such grieving moments and doing the inappropriate things mm -hmm. that they're actually suffering. There's a oh, absolutely. Yes. And, <laughs> and I think that can help with the forgiveness part, you know, um, realizing mm -hmm. that they're doing this action because they're hurting within, mm -hmm. not necessarily trying to hurt you. Um, right. And that's I, somehow. Yeah. I think that was a turning point. I think that was a turning point for me is realizing that my husband was not my enemy and that he was broken and that he was just trying to, to get, get some healing. <laughs> and that brings up a great point. I think everyone that's listening to this, if you're a woman, you're thinking you were the one that was um, broken and you were trying not to be shattered, mm -hmm. but in the exact same way he was broken, mm -hmm. he, you know, had a failed marriage. He wasn't, um, 
faithful to you. He felt shattered in, in all these different relationships and, and where could he really lay his hat and his heart and everything. So he was torn. He was shattering. And he was like, how do I put this all back together? And so it's never just one way. And that people come into our lives, or at least I believe they do, for each of us to learn and grow from it. Mm -hmm. So can I ask you, how is your husband doing? And how are your relationship doing? Oh, we're doing wonderful. He is um, five and a half years sober. And we are actually marriage mentors in our community. Wonderful. And we have developed a curriculum around the higher overarching principles of my book so that it can be applied to any um, difficult circumstance that one might go through. So, yeah, we're, we're doing well. And I, I end my book with saying, you know, it's not like a, a pretty package I can stick a red bow on and say everything's wonderful because, of course, all marriages have their ups and downs. And so I don't want to seem like it's, it's an unrealistic, perfect marriage. Um, but it's certainly one now of transparency and um, certainly trust and healing and, and forgiveness. <laughs> Beautiful. That's really gorgeous. And, you know, it's, it's amazing. I'm looking at your draft behind you. And I think giraffe um, is a totem means about high reaching, clearer vision, seeing beyond what mm -hmm. you're actually um, coexisting in. Mm -hmm. And so um, you know, your husband actually saw this when he was jogging, he had a higher vision mm -hmm. and you too, even though you were on the ground crying and broken, right. um, you didn't shatter and that you came above and saw much more beyond. And I, I must say, cause even my husband's story and mine, um, these are very wonderful men because they allowed us to share that story in our books. And there are so many men that would never allow mm -hmm. that to be public because that would be, um, a negative inference on them not, you right. know, satisfying our relationships. And yeah. I know my husband says, and he's been to talks when I've given them mm -hmm. that he says, if I can help other people to realize yeah. that it's always not greener on the other side of the road, you know, <laughs> that we're right. here to learn and grow and that with faith that, um, you know, your lives can be totally transformed. Yeah, and I think with this particular story, there is a lot of shame attached to it, so it doesn't get talked about very often. And mm -hmm. so my husband is very open because there have been many times where he has been out speaking or been with me, and a lot of people come up and say, thank you for sharing, you know, me too. And so it opens the door for people to be able to hopefully change there and make better decisions in the future. So. Right. Right. So is there a big picture lesson that anyone going through a challenge can learn from your story? What would that be? The big picture lesson, I think, is regardless of what your difficult story is, um, I learned that if I had followed society or societal expectations, and if I had followed the way I was raised to be independent and look out for number one, and that I didn't deserve this, and if I had um, followed the statistics surrounding this story, um, that we wouldn't be married. And instead, I followed um, my faith and what I thought to be right. And I followed maybe perhaps even a new meaning of justice, which isn't about righting wrongs or punishment for bad choices, but rather a justice that is a reconciliation of a relationship. And um, so that would be my message is, uh, you know, don't go with the crowd, go with, you know, what your heart's telling you and what your faith is telling you and, and what you know to be right. Um, if there's a mantra we use with our children, it's don't be a follower of this world, be a leader for what's right. And that's what we try to teach them. And that's what I had to do in order to get through this, this story. <laughs> right. And you both really were in each other's lives for look at this beautiful message that you brought to the world together mm -hmm. um, that will help people realize that we are often seeking things that are so far beyond our reach that have mm -hmm. no palpable value that we need to look within ourselves mm -hmm. to find that value, to find our lessons and our intuition as mm -hmm. to what is the voice of our soul and of God that mm -hmm. we can actually touch the world in a very specific and loving way. Mm -hmm. And it is profound. Mm -hmm. It's very profound. So yeah. this has really been wonderful. And I, I just want to say for people who, um, who don't have relationships and that want to approach or to open up to trusting in relationships, whether it's putting yourself out in a bigger way at work or mm -hmm. 
joining groups that you normally wouldn't you know, mm-hmm. navigate to. Listen to your soul. Like, like Courtney said, I think it's so important. I, I'm a really strong believer in intuition. And when you follow the truth of your soul, which will only lead you in the right path, your mm-hmm. soul will never lead you down harm's way. And when you learn to trust that wisdom from yourself, which is also an extension from God, it's, it's the voice of the connection of both, mm-hmm. that you will realize the road you need to take. And for some people that are in relationships, and I know you'll agree here, Courtney, that you're unsafe and that you are in harm's way that your soul is telling you, you need to be safe. So we're not saying every relationship you should stay because there are times when you do need to leave. Mm -hmm. And part of that is learning that God's voice is saying, you need to value yourself. You need to trust Mm -hmm. that you deserve better and Mm -hmm. be safe and your children need to be safe. And that's your mantra. That's your life's lesson that you need to learn. Wouldn't you agree? I just want to clarify, not everyone should stay in relationships. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. That was the message I felt um, God was giving me was don't leave yet because he knew Mark's heart. He knew that he was working towards um, getting whole again and getting um, well again. And so I don't, I don't believe in a God that's going to allow you to stay in a relationship that is unsafe. Um, (laughs) Well, and some people are still in that relationship, but they need to have the courage and strength and that faith and hope realizing that God is working with you and through you to bring you to a better place. So I encourage everyone to find that um, inner peace in that better relationship with your God or creator, whatever word you talk about Mm -hmm. and, um, and really connect with what is right in your life and what path you're supposed to be taking. Yeah, I agree. Thanks, Cynthia. I would love people to know that they are loved by God. Yep. (laughs) <laughs> well, do you have any parting words before we close our show tonight? Um, I just want to, is it okay if I show the cover of my book? Please do. I love it. <laughs> it's great. Read it. It's probably backwards, but. <laughs> no, it's good. I can read it. Go ahead and say what it is. All right. It's Clay Jar Cracked, When We're Broken But Not Shattered. And where can we find your wonderful book? You can, well, you can find it anywhere online at your typical Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and um, all those other retailers, and also at CourtneyDonaldson.com. Great. And I've read it, and I've reviewed it, and I have my review posted on Amazon. So I encourage all of you to go to Amazon. It's usually the most frequent everyone goes to read the testimonies or endorsements. And I believe you also have a whiteboard animation, which I love (laughs) about her book. So, um, Really, it's a great book, and if this book is not for you, it may be one that you want to buy even for someone else. So it's a great gift for Valentine's, <laughs> birthdays, anniversaries. Um, we can all use improvements in our relationships and relationship with our God. So thank you so much for being with us, Courtney. It's really been a pleasure. Thank I wish you. you much success in your book sales and speaking uh, tour, and um, it's really been a delight having you. Thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you all. And until next Tuesday, we'll see you. Have a wonderful, blessed week. And remember, you're powerful beyond measure. Take care all.